Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending this GenScript-sponsored webinar titled Characterizing B-Cells and Their Antibodies Using Single-Cell RNA Sequencing. My name is Dr. Grace Tan. I am a marketing specialist at GenScript and will be helping to moderate today's webinar. In order to ensure that this webinar has high sound quality, we ask that you activate listening-only mode in your GoToWebinar setting or mute your microphone. If you have a question for the speaker or the moderators, please type it into the chat box for us to see. The speaker will be taking your questions at the end of the webinar. However, if we run out of time and he is unable to get to your question, we will be sure to send his response to you via email. So without further ado, let me introduce our speaker today, Derek Crute. Derek completed his bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering at Brown University and is currently completing his PhD in bioengineering at Stanford University in Dr. Stephen Quake's laboratory. His research focuses on applying cutting edge single cell technology and bioinformatics to better understand immuno immunological perturbations across a diverse set of diseases. And his impactful research work on the cloning of high affinity allergen specific IgE antibodies from human B cells was recently published in the journal Science. Thank you, Derek, for joining us today. Please take it away. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And so today I'd like to talk about single cell RNA sequencing and specifically single cell RNA seq applied to B cells. And so I first wanted to start off with some motivation and that would be why study single B cells? Can bulk assays provide us similar information? And the reason we need to study single B cells lies in the structure of, of antibodies themselves. See, antibodies are heterodimers composed of two identical heavy chains and two identical light chains. The important part here is that these, each of these chains is encoded by uh, genes that lie on separate chromosomes. And <clears throat> if you were to perform a bulk assay and lyse the cells, for example, you would lose that critical pairing information of heavy and light chain. And so now you might say, single cell cloning and expression techniques have existed for quite some time and people have applied them in a number of contexts. Why should we use single cell RNA sequencing on B cells? And I would argue that single cell RNA seq is able to provide a really rich data set for each B cell. So not only do you get the antibody sequence, which gives you specificity and affinity, after cloning and recombinant expression, but you also get a lot of information about the cells themselves. And you're therefore able to couple information about the cells with specificity via the antibody. And some of the examples of information you get for each cell are shown here. For example, with gene expression, you get information like cellular phenotype and cell state. For example, whether the B cell is a plasmoblast, a plasma cell, a memory B cell, a naive B cell, or and or whether it's in an activated state. In addition, you also get splicing within each of these genes. So for example, you can see um, for B cells, whether there is membrane exon splicing of the antibody transcript. You can also do variant calling from single cell RNA-seq data and then get information on monolelic or biallelic expression and even do haplotype phasing. Lastly, with some methods of single cell RNA-seq, you're also able to couple information on surface marker expression. For example, if you use flow cytometry. And so with that kind of motivation, I wanted to jump into an overview of methods of single cell RNA sequencing. And so here's an overview where you start with a biological sample of interest, for example, blood or a tissue, and you have to generate a single cell suspension. For blood, that is easy because it's already a single cell suspension, but there are also methods for tissues which enable you to dissociate the tissue and generate that single cell suspension. Next is the physical isolation or separation of single cells, and there are a number of modalities that you can use to do this, which I'll talk about shortly. But once those cells are separated, they're then processed according to the following First, the cellular mRNA is reverse transcribed, typically with 
an oligo DT primer that hybridizes to the poly A tail of mRNA transcripts. That mRNA is converted to cDNA during this reverse transcription step. Then the cDNA is subsequently amplified using PCR in order to generate enough cDNA for sequencing. Before these amplicons can be sequenced, however, um, they need to be processed with an additional step, which adds sequencing adapters to the ends of these cDNA molecules such that they are able to bind to the sequencing flow cell. Next up, cells are pooled and sequenced, typically on an Illumina instrument, um, generating short reads anywhere from 2 by 75 to 2 by 300 base pair. And lastly, the sequencing data is analyzed. And I'll talk about a number of uh, ways to do that. Um, for example, as I mentioned before, gene expression, splicing, clustering, and so forth. And so now I wanted to dig deeper into the, some of these steps that I just mentioned. The first being the physical isolation or separation of single cells. And what I've outlined here are three or four kind of common modalities that people use to separate single cells. And they have a number of advantages and disadvantages. Microfluidics was used very commonly a number of years back. Um, and it benefits from high sensitivity in the way that cells are captured in small microfluidic chambers. However, it suffers from lower throughput given the physical design of these microfluidic chips. Increasing in throughput, next up is flow cytometry, so FACTS, fluorescent activated cell sorting, in which single cells are interrogated via laser and then sorted one cell per well into either a 96 or 384 well plate. And this has the benefit of higher throughput with only modestly reduced sensitivity. A downside of this is that there's a larger expertise required in that the, the flow cytometer has to be operated in single cell sort mode and each individual plate has to be processed um, through the preceding, through the subsequent steps of reverse transcription and PCR. Increasing further in throughput are methods relying on droplets or microwells in which tens of thousands to millions of B cells can be interrogated in parallel. And so while this has the benefits of very high throughput, in some cases you lose the ability to interrogate splicing or do variant calling. And typically the sensitivity of these methods is lower. And by sensitivity, I mean the um, capture efficiency of each individual transcript from a cell um, and consequently the number of genes detected per cell. And so once you have your cells isolated, the choice of amplification scheme or chemistry is really critical, uh, especially when applied to B cells. And what I mean is, and in, in why B cells are particularly um, distinct is that full length cDNA is required in order to capture the heavy and light chain transcripts that comprise individual antibodies. So for example, we're not just interested in the gene expression of single cells. We need to capture as well as the full antibody sequence, which could be anywhere from half a KB to two KBs in length. And so for that, some sequencing chemistries will work and others will not. Those that will, as I said, generate full length cDNA where Small Illumina reads cover the entire length of the transcript, while those that will not work typically fall under a three prime end counting chemistry, where you're only typically getting the three prime end of these molecules when you sequence. And so I wanted to now kind of quickly walk through one example chemistry that will generate full length cDNA that enables us to get gene expression and antibody sequence out of the sequencing data. And so the first step is cell lysis, where you then have the cellular mRNA being reverse transcribed by an oligo DT primer. And what's important here is that this primer has a nucleotide handle called an ISPCR sequence on the end shown in green. During the reverse transcription step, there's a little chemistry trick that's played where um, a couple of C's get added to the five prime end of the cDNA molecule, which hybridize to those Gs that are shown in the template switch oligo or TSO. And importantly, the TSO also has the ISPCR 
nucleotide sequence, which enables in the subsequent PCR step, the amplification of the entire transcriptome with just a single ISPCR primer. And so with that, you now have the entire transcriptome amplified, so all genes that the cell has expressed, and you need to prepare this cDNA pool for sequencing. And this step is called tagmentation, where a TN5 transposase adds um, read one and read two um, sequencing, uh, partial sequencing adapters, which are then PCR amplified to generate a full sequence ready molecule that goes on an Illumina sequencer. And so that, that was a quick overview of single cell RNA sequencing, focusing importantly on what makes single cell RNA seq different uh, for B cells in particular, one being the isolation of the B cells, there are different modes for that, and two being which chemistries can and cannot be used um, for this cell type. Now I'd like to dig in a little bit more to bioinformatic approaches to antibody assembly, because for all of single cell RNA-seq, you're going to use similar tools for gene expression and splicing analysis, but for B cells and T cells, in fact, in particular, um, you need to perform the additional step of uh, bioinformatic sequence reconstruction. And to frame the problem, what, what we need is anywhere from a, you know, a half a kb to two kb continuous sequence in order to reconstruct the heavy and light chain. However, the problem is that paradend Illumina sequencing reads are only roughly two by 100 base pair. So how do we regenerate that full heavy and light chain transcript from these short reads? And the solution is a de Bruijn graph, where I'll walk through a simple example here um, in which you generate sequencing reads, and these are called camers here. There are four shown that you then subsequently break into substrings of length k minus one. And I've shown that below each of these k-mers where you have a left k minus one mer and a right k minus one mer. You can then construct the de Bruijn graph as follows. Each of these k minus one mers are nodes in the de Bruijn graph. So I'll walk through. The first is GC, the second is CA, next is AT, then we have TG, next is CA, except we already have it, so we won't add it, and we will instead add the next AA. Then TG and GC we already have again. To reassemble the sequence from these nodes, we draw edges between each left and right K minus one mer. So we'll start on the left with the GCA K mer. There is an edge between GC and CA, so we'll draw that. There's an edge between AT and TG, we'll draw that. Similarly, an edge between CA and AA. And lastly, an edge between TG and GC. And now the process finally involves simply walking along the nodes according to the edges and reconstructing the sequence. So we'll start at AT in the center and walk to TG, GC, CA, and AA. And here we've bioinformatically reconstructed a full length sequence from shorter Illumina sequencing reads. And so this is a toy example, but the principle applies to full antibody assembly. Luckily, you don't have to implement these algorithms yourself. Um, they've already been implemented, and there are a number of standalone tools that are available which help do this reconstruction. However, we're not done yet. Um, we've only assembled the heavy and light chain sequences, we still need to add annotation. And so that process is typically accomplished with tools such as IGBLAST or IMGT's vQuest. And these are available as standalone tools or they're available online where you're able to simply submit your sequence and receive the results back in a web browser. And annotations that these tools will add will typically be some of the following. Um, this is a non-exhaustive exhaustive list, but for example, it'll say whether the sequence is functional, whether it has any insertions or deletions. It'll call the V, D, and J genes for the sequence, as well as, for example, the CDR3. And so I use a tool called Changeo to parse the output of IGBLAST or IMGT, and that yields kind of a nice table as shown below, where 
I have two example cells. For each cell, there is a heavy chain and a light chain, and the annotations are included such that I'm able to see, uh, for example, all of the V calls, D calls, and J calls, as well as the identity of these sequences, the germline, and, and other um, information as well, such as the isotype. Now, a further step we could do after annotating these sequences is to assess the clonality of our single cells. And why we might want to do that is to uh, assess things like uh, immune perturbations. We might want to find disease-responsive disease antibodies. For example, if someone receives uh, a vaccination and you see an expansion of certain clones, you might think that those clones are relevant to the vaccine response. Or you can do things like characterize patterns of affinity maturation in large clones that have large number of sequences and a cascade of somatic hypermutation. So the approach to generate these, what are called clonal families, is to typically group cells with a similar heavy chain sequence according to um, a shared B gene, J gene, CDR3 length, and CDR3 sequence with some similarity. And so there's a bit of debate there, but somewhere between 75 and 95% and similarity cutoff between the heavy chain CDR3s for cl forming clonal families. And an illustration of, of this process is, sh is shown at the right. And I'll go through um, with my own research uh, how this informed the discovery of high affinity allergen specific antibodies later. With that, I'd like to quickly go into um, how to generate monoclonal antibodies from our single cell sequencing assemblies. And so we've done single cell RNA-seq. We've used bioinformatics to assemble the sequences. And what I've used for my research is GenScript's HTP gene to antibody uh, production workflow, which has really been fantastic because for me, I can generate the sequences informatically, as I've just described, and then send those amino acid or nucleotide sequences to GenScript and they will synthesize the heavy and light chains. Um, they will prepare those, clone them, transient transfect them into mammalian cells, express, purify, quality control them, and then send the recombinant monoclonal antibodies back to me. And so that's been really helpful in increasing the, the throughput of our research and that I can focus on analyzing the specificity, affinity, and epitopes of these antibodies rather than worrying about expressing them, cloning them, and whatnot. And so with the last part of this talk, I want to tie together everything I've mentioned, methods of single cell RNA sequencing, bioinformatic approaches, the generation of monoclonal antibodies, all applied to novel insights into food allergy, um, revealed by coupling the data you get from single cell RNA sequencing with the functional data you get from generating monoclonal antibodies. And so I want to introduce you to the IgE isotype. It's extremely rare, even in allergic individuals. Um, orders of magnitude less abundant in plasma than uh, isotypes such as IgG1. And although it evolved, we believe, to uh, protect us against parasitic worms, Typically in the Western world now, it's, it's more related to the symptoms of allergy. And how it directly mediates allergies are as follows. A B cell, typically a plasmoblast or a plasma cell, will secrete IgE antibodies. They'll then bind to high affinity uh, receptors on mast cells and basophils. When someone who is allergic, for example, someone who is allergic to peanuts, accidentally consumes a food consu uh, containing peanut, what will happen is IgE antibodies on the surface of those mast cells and basophils will crosslink, causing those cells to degranulate. And that degranulation process releases things like cytokines, proteases, and histamine. And that's why people with allergies need to take antihistamine um, because of this, this reaction here. And now, while this process has been well known for quite some time, meaning people have known about IgE and its cause of allergies for quite a while, no one has been able to isolate the single 
B cells that produce IgE antibodies, even from allergic individuals, because of their scarcity. And so that was the focus of my research, developing, developing a workflow to isolate single IgE B cells. And so what I did was start with blood from individuals with food allergies, which I then performed an enrichment for B cells. I did single cell sorting, uh, the flow cytometry, to isolate as many IgE producing B cells as I could, and then perform the single cell RNA sequencing workflow with the SmartSeq2 chemistry I described before. And so again, from that data, you get things like gene expression, splicing, variant analysis, and you're able to bioinformatically reconstruct the heavy and light chains. Furthermore, I cloned a number of these antibodies through GenScript service and tested their affinities uh, to peanut allergens, which I'll describe. So the first thing um, I would like to discuss is the B cell subtypes found in peripheral blood. Now, I sorted as many IgE B cells as possible, but I also intentionally sorted via slow, slow cytometry B cells of other isotypes in order to provide a comparison to IgE B cells. And so the results of principal component analysis on the single cells is shown on the left, where these single cells generally cluster into two distinct types, a naive or memory B cell subclass or a plasmoblast subclass. And now these two are very distinct by gene expression, as shown in the center, where a triad of transcription factors, PRDM1, XBP1, and IRF4, drive cell differentiation towards the plasma blast fate, whereas IRF8 is an antagonist to IRF4, drives B cells towards a memory phenotype, and MS4A1, which is the canonical B cell surface marker, CD20, illustrates that naive and memory B cells display this surface marker, while plasma blasts do not. And so one thing I found was quite striking in that as opposed to other isotypes, IgE B cells were a majority of the plasma blast subclass. And that can be seen on the right there, where most of the um, IgE B cells are colored in blue, whereas isotypes of um, B cells of other isotypes are majority of naive or memory. From there, I went and looked at unique characteristics that differentiate IgE plasma blasts from other plasma blasts. So, for example, IgA plasma blasts or IgG plasma blasts. And what I discovered was that IgE plasma blasts have a distinct transcriptional program that, image, that, that suggests they are more immature and uh, have a reduced capacity for proliferation and activation. And so that's one example of applying gene expression to understand um, B cell subtypes. But I also wanted to present an example where splicing informed our understanding of these rare B cells as well. And that's shown on the right, where you can see gene coverage histograms of the heavy chain constant region sequences of different antibodies. And importantly, on the top shown is the uh, exons for each gene, and below is the coverage. And what you can notice is as opposed to IgG1 and IgA1, IgE has very little coverage of the terminal two exons, which correspond to the membrane spanning domain. So we can see that IgE B cells are deficient in membrane spanning exon splicing, which has implications for our understanding of allergic memory, and that these B cells may be um, unable to receive activation stimulation as much as other isotypes through their B cell receptors. I then took all of the reconstructed antibody sequences and generated clonal families. And what's shown here is a set of clonal families where each cell is a node. The color of the cell corresponds to the isotype of this antibody, and the shape of the node corresponds to which subject that cell originated from. The size of each node corresponds to the mutation frequency of that antibody. So larger nodes mean the antibody has more somatic hypermutation and is more affinity matured. And then if the node 
has a dark outline that indicates it was a plasma blast as opposed to a naive or memory B cell. And so I wanted to talk quickly about one clonal family that really stood out from this data, and that's clonal family one, because it contains six plasma blasts, three of which originated from subject PA12 and three of which originated from subject PA13. And what was striking is that the antibody sequences, especially the heavy chain and light chain CDR3 sequences, were highly similar among these six antibodies, which indicates convergent evolution between unrelated individuals. And so while this was really exciting, we didn't yet have specificity or affinity data for these antibodies. So I used GenScript service to clone and express them and then assess whether they bind major peanut allergens. And so these allergens are well known. They're typically proteins and clinicians have done extensive work characterizing them. And they're shown here with the abbreviations RH1, 2, and 3, of which RH2 is the most clinically important in terms of predicting disease severity. And what was striking is that as in contrast to mouse monoclonal antibodies, which only bound a single peanut allergen, shown on the right of the ELISA um, in the bottom right, these six antibodies bound with high affinity and bound cross-reactively to RH2 and RH3 without binding the negative control, BSA. And so what I then did is assess the affinity for of each of these antibodies to RH2 and RH3 individually. And that's shown here um, on the right where each of the circles corresponds to one of those six antibodies. But taking this one step further, what I wanted to understand was how this high affinity and cross reactivity originated in these antibodies. And to do that, what I did is use GenScript service to um, test a number of variants of these antibodies that I took and reverted specific portions of the sequence to the inferred germline. And so I'll walk through a number of reversions one at a time. The first being the reversion of the heavy chain variable region frameworks. And so here shows that I've kept the actual late chain variable region sequence, but only swapped the frameworks on the heavy chain for the inferred germline. And the change in affinity is shown in the blue circle on the right. And what we found was that the this reversion in particular decreased affinity to both RH2 and RH3. I then created another variant in which I reverted just the CDR3 of the heavy chain to the inferred germline, and that actually had no effect on the affinity for the antibody for RH2 or RH3, and that was because there was actually only two amino acids different. I reverted just the CDR2 of the heavy chain variable region while keeping the light chain variable region the same, and it had the surprising effect of slightly decreasing RH2 affinity, but greatly increasing RH3 affinity. Reverting just the CDR1 of the heavy chain variable region had a similar effect to reverting the frameworks in that it decreased the affinity of the antibody to RH2 and RH3. I then made more substantial reversions. In this case, what I'm showing is the reversion of the entire heavy chain variable region to the inferred germline while keeping the actual light chain variable region. And what we can see is substantial decrease in RH2 affinity, orders of magnitude in fact, with little decrease in RH3 affinity. In contrast, reverting the light chain variable region while keeping the act chain, actual heavy chain variable region had a stronger or more prominent effect on the RH3 affinity as opposed to RH2 making a even larger um, or more substantial change to the antibody. I reverted both the heavy and light chain variable region. And what this did was essentially eliminate all RH3 cross reactivity and substantially decreasing RH2 affinity. 
And so what this suggests is that in independent individuals, please remember there were six antibodies, three from one and three from the other, naive B cells underwent identical gene rearrangements that produced a naive antibody that was able to bind RH2 with some affinity, nanomolar affinity, and not bind RH3. And then only through the acquisition of mutations on both the heavy chain and the light chain were these antibodies able to generate the cross-reactivity and high affinity that we observed in circulating plasma blasts of these individuals. Lastly, I want to show the importance of the light chain. I, in this example, I kept the actual heavy chain variable region and swapped out the variable region of the light chain and found it eliminated binding to um, RH2 and RH3 completely. And this was done swapping the kappa for another um, kappa light chain. And so with that, I want to conclude just by saying that single cell RNA sequencing is a powerful tool for coupling cell state, for example, cell type or activation status with the specificity of that cell's antibody. So we have plasma blasts, for example, coupled to an antibody that binds RH2 and RH3 in food allergic individuals. And in this manner, I've demonstrated that single cell RNA sequencing can be applied to inform the discovery of interesting antibodies in health and disease. And want to end on a high note saying that new technologies are continuously being developed that making single cell RNA sequencing faster, higher throughput, and available to labs without um, specific uh, expertise in these areas. So I just wanted to say thank you for your time and attention. Um, I could be contact via Twitter or email, and I'm sure GenScript will pass on any questions you have if I don't get time to answer those. Thank you. Thank you, Derek, for such a wonderful presentation. We will now move on to the Q&A portion of this presentation. Please take a few moments now to type your questions into the question box. While you're typing in your questions, I would like to review some of GenScript's recombinant antibody services and key service features. GenScript's high throughput gene to antibody service is a popular service for researchers wishing to generate several small scale full length antibodies for the development of, therape of therapeutic antibody drug candidates and reagent antibodies. Customers using this service can choose to receive either cell culture supernatants or purified antibodies in as little as 18 business days. Cost-effective economy and standard service options are available. GenScript's newly upgraded MAMPILOT guaranteed antibody expression service is useful for researchers looking to receive purified recombinant antibodies. Customers can choose from a flexible expression scale ranging from 5 to 100 milligrams, and antibody production has a quick turnaround time of as little as 20 business days. Antibody yields, purity, and endotoxin levels are all guaranteed for this service. GenScript's team of protein and antibody experts are always looking to help researchers achieve their research goals. Please review our comprehensive set of reagent services on our website, www.genscript.com. All right, with that being said, we will start our Q&A session. 